The obsession with Squid Games is something else. It launched a month ago and has 111 million viewers worldwide, and it's apparently worth $900 million. Am I the only one who thought this was a video game where you fight squids? I know I'm advertising my ignorance here, but this is what happens when you're a geek who watches BBC and Outlander. I have a lot to catch you up on, but before we start, please hit that subscribe button below and like this video. Colin Powell, who was the first black secretary of state, died of COVID-related complications this week at the age of 84. And most people only focused on his biggest mistake, which was convincing the world that we needed to invade Iraq. But it's not fair to taint his legacy this way. So I wanna explain what you need to know about him. Colin Powell came from a very modest background. He was raised in the South Bronx by his parents who had immigrated from Jamaica. And he wasn't a very successful student, but he joined ROTC and from there spent 35 years in the army. He was a Vietnam vet and he rose to the rank of four-star general, becoming the first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And that's when he became really well known after overseeing Operation Desert Storm in 1991, which is a fast and successful war in Kuwait to push back against the Iraqi military that had invaded. After that, the Powell Doctrine was born, which was basically what he felt was necessary for successful military action. That going to war should only be the last resort, should have broad public support, and if you do go to war, you need to go in tough and know how you're getting out. Clearly our presidents have all followed this doctrine. When President Bush Jr. wanted to go to war in Iraq, Colin Powell was against it. He tried to tell the president it would be a bad idea. And in fact, he predicted how things would turn out there if we were to invade. But Bush's mind was made up, and for Colin Powell, it was either he stay and help, or he was out of the job. So he stayed, thinking that if he were on the inside, he could at least help make this war successful. But he wasn't in charge of leading the war. He was Secretary of State by then, so he was told to go sell the war to everyone. And so forever we'll remember this moment at the UN, where he convinced the world we needed to go to Iraq because of an alleged chemical weapons stockpile there. But that was based on faulty intelligence that at the time he didn't know was wrong. Since that point, Colin Powell was very open about the mistakes made. The thing people need to know about him is not just his achievements and mistakes, but it's also his character and how he consistently fought for a better world and better America. This is a man who faced racism during his military career, and he brushed it aside and still served. He was a man of integrity, who although was a Republican political official, he didn't shy away from criticizing Republican leaders. He cared deeply about children at risk and founded a nonprofit called America's Promise to help them. He was a big believer in diplomacy and strengthening alliances and using all our resources to fight for peace. And when he made a mistake, he owned up to it and shared the story so that we could learn from it. Find me any leader that does that. So I wanted to explain this all so you can appreciate Colin Powell's story, know that he couldn't have prevented the war in Iraq, and know that he was a lot more than that fateful day at the UN. Oh, Lebanon. For those of you who have Oh My World stress balls, start squeezing them. At the end of last week, seven people were killed when gunfire broke out during a protest against the judge who's investigating those responsible for the mass explosion last year. That's when nearly 3,000 tons of ammonium nitrate stored at the port in Beirut exploded, killing over 200 people, injuring thousands, and displacing hundreds of thousands. So now a series of judges have been appointed to find those responsible, and the current one has charged two people with negligence related to this blast. And there are two former ministers, and they're currently in the parliament, and they're part of a Shia political party called Amal. And since everything in Lebanon is religiously motivated, Amal and their partner Hezbollah protested the decision and the judge behind it. For a while now, Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, has been working publicly to discredit this judge and the investigation, which kind of makes you wonder, what you hiding there, buddy? If you have nothing to worry about, then why not let the man do his job? So Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization backed by Iran, plans this protest, and then gunfire breaks out, which they claim was caused by alleged snipers from a Christian militia. But there hasn't been any proof of that. Luckily, the Lebanese president reacted to this crisis with a sense of urgency. Puts a whole new meaning to the expression, work hard, play hard, right? Shout out to my friend Savag for giving me the inspiration here. Things have since calmed down, but the thing you need to know is that this is just another example of how Hezbollah holds the country hostage through violence and what that could do to Lebanon's future and our national security interests there. Now, the new prime minister has promised to get international financial aid, but for that to happen, the government and banks are gonna have to agree to some pretty major reforms. And if I were them, I would do it or risk losing the entire country to Iran, which won't be good for anyone in the end. 16 Americans and one Canadian were kidnapped in Haiti this week while they were visiting an orphanage in an area that is controlled by a dangerous gang. 
Five children were included, including an eight-month-old baby. And now the gang is demanding a million dollars ransom per person. So $17 million. Those kidnapped are part of a U.S. nonprofit called Christian Aid Ministries, and they say they were helping rebuild homes after the August earthquake. They also say they were supporting school children, distributing Bibles, giving medicine, teaching pastors, and providing food for the elderly. Can I just say, when people say Americans aren't good, this is what Americans do. They run into a disaster, no matter how risky, and help people. And that's great. But the problem here is that by trying to help those less fortunate, you not only risk endangering yourself and your family, but your ransom ends up further strengthening these gangs. Since Haiti's prime minister was assassinated in July, gangs have basically taken over half the country. I'm not exaggerating here. You need to know this if you're thinking of going there. Since July, there has been a 300% increase in kidnappings, and over 600 have taken place this year, including 29 foreigners. The gang that committed this kidnapping is called 400 Mawozo, which translates from Creole as 400 inexperienced men. And we all know how much we love inexperienced men. Now they're gonna demand a way higher ransom for a foreigner, and paying the ransom is not illegal unless the kidnapper is a terrorist organization, which isn't the case here. But what you need to know is that ultimately these ransoms only strengthen these criminals, and they encourage more kidnapping as a business. I'm not saying we should leave them there. I'm just advising you all not to go to dangerous places, however altruistic you feel the mission might be. The FBI is advising the missionary group on the negotiations, but this may take a while, so in the meantime, I'm praying for a speedy release. <laughs> The Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is known as ASEAN, has refused to allow Myanmar's military to attend its summit next week, which is a big deal because this association usually doesn't like to interfere in domestic issues. ASEAN is a regional organization made up of 10 Southeast Asian countries that address economic, security, and political issues. So the foreign ministers of ASEAN got together and decided that the Myanmar military sucks and isn't creating stability on the ground like it had promised. So they said that its leader couldn't attend. And here's the amazing part. In response, the Myanmar military said it would release over 5,600 people they jailed for anti-regime activity. But ASEAN is still not accepting the military's participation. And it's amazing because it underscores a point we try to make here all the time, which is that we need to punish and hold accountable those who pursue coups or commit human rights abuses or try to steal land so that they don't think they can get away with it, since that will only encourage more bad behavior. You wouldn't do that to a toddler, so why would you do it to a dictator? The reason the military now released these political prisoners is because it wants to be at the ASEAN summit. It wants that legitimacy. It wants that platform. It wants the economic benefits that come with being a member. And so while it's good they're releasing these prisoners, until the military stops detaining and killing people and allows for free and fair elections, it's going to remain on my list. And apparently ASEAN's too. <laughs> Samuel Chu is a badass community organizer and Hong Konger fighting for democracy. He's American and originally from Hong Kong, and he founded the Hong Kong Democracy Council, which fought for Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement in the United States. He's worked to pass some critical legislation and has fought for a number of policies to support Hong Kong, and as a result, authorities there have issued an arrest warrant for him. In fact, he's wanted by the Hong Kong police for allegedly inciting secession and collusion with foreign governments to endanger Chinese security. Samuel is also the son of the Reverend Chu Yu Ming, who occupies Central that led to the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong in 2014. Two years ago, his father was tried, convicted, and sentenced on protest-related charges. Samuel has a long list of achievements as a community organizer in issues beyond democracy in Hong Kong. And in our interview, he explains why that prepared him for his most important fight. Hi, geeks! I am here again in Miami at the Also Freedom Forum with my new geeky friend, Samuel Chu, who is a Hong Konger democracy activist. He has a lot of accomplishments under his belt. Very intimidating. Very exciting to meet you. Share a little bit about your personal story. Um, you know, what it's like to fight for activism, how you, you've you obviously been raised in this world. Tell everybody a little bit about that story. Yeah. So I, you know, it's in some way, this is in the DNA. I sort of, in, in some way, I, I some people, my friends make fun of me that I was, it, this is inevitable. This is sort of destiny. Uh, there's a little bit of like the Harry Potter, uh, you know, like uh, the thing. So my father, back in 20, uh, 1989, was one of the supporters that helped uh, support the Tiananmen Square student protests uh, in Beijing. And when the massacre happened, when the CCP came in and rode the tanks and fired the machine guns, my father actually helped rescue, through an underground railroad that he helped build, the dissident who escaped the massacre. And then they hid them in, 
safe houses in Hong Kong. And this is actually the interesting part of the story is that like I had a front row seat. I actually spent evenings and weekends playing soccer and playing cards with these dissidents who were hiding, who had just escaped machine guns and, and tanks. And so it really ingrained in me, I think, this idea of not just that this is a, a, a movement of all of us, that this is our future at stake, but also that we should be doing whatever we can to risk whatever we can to be helpful and to be supportive. And so I actually was sent away to come to the U.S. when I was a teenager at 12. My father thought that there might be some retaliation. So I came here and I spent most of my career in the U.S. working on social justice here. But really, I think for me, when the movement continued in Hong Kong in 2014 and in 2019, what I really saw was that, yes, the protest was getting attention, but it wasn't getting the real changes that was necessary in U.S. politics and global politics. And that I just look back and realize that I have spent my last 20 years preparing for exactly this moment. All the relationship I've built, all the experience I had fighting for equality and social justice now can be applied to be the international front line for the movement in Hong Kong. And that really, I think, you know, when I look back, you know, obviously none of us knew in 1990 when I arrived in the U.S. that I would end up leading the U.S. campaign for Hong Kong. But that's kind of what exactly happened. And in a way, it's ironic for the CCP because they essentially forced my father to send me to the U.S. and I turned out to be a thorn in their side 30 years later. I love that. That is so true. And that is such a good way to put it, right? And it's one of those, it's one of the arguments I always make is that these dictators and thugs think that by silencing people or imprisoning people or forcing them to go into exile, that that's somehow going to help them maintain power. And it actually always backfires. They never really seem to notice that though. Samuel's awesome, and he has as much energy as I do, which is hard to find. I want to say a huge thanks to him and to the Human Rights Foundation and also Freedom Forum for making this interview possible. If you want more, you can get the full interview on our YouTube channel, so make sure to check that out next. Thanks, geeks. Keep your eyes and ears peeled, because apparently Facebook is changing its name next week since they think a rebrand will help give them a new look. And I want to know what you think it should be called, so let us know in the comments below. Maybe we promise not to steal your information book, or country before company book, or we now hate Russian advertising book. Maybe we work hard for the money book. She works hard for the money, uh-huh, uh-huh. So hard for the money, uh-huh, uh-huh. Before you go, please hit that subscribe button below and like this video. And if you have any questions, feedback, or stories you want me to talk about, please leave a comment or reach out directly to me on the socials. Stay fabulous, geeks. Oh, yeah.